were talking in Cambridge University, and perhaps the best student we ever had here was Isaac Newton, who was a student here in the 1860s, and he is famous because he achieved the first unification in physics. He realized that the force that makes the apple fall and which holds us onto the ground is the same as the force which holds the moon in its orbit around us and holds the planets in their orbit around the sun. He showed that uh, everything could be understood in our solar system if objects moved under the action of a force which depended on their mass and fell off as the inverse square of the distance. If things are twice as far away, the force is four times weaker. And this was a wonderful insight and this allowed him to understand the motions of the planets and why we have eclipses, etc. Newton was actually rather lucky in that he uh, seized on one of the few phenomena in nature which we can both understand and predict. We can understand gravity, we can understand the motion of the planets, and we can actually predict the motion of the planets. Many things in science we can't understand at all, but even when we can understand something, we often can't make predictions. For instance, weather. We understand what causes the weather, but we famously can't predict the weather more than a few days ahead, which becomes chaotic. But in the case of gravity and the planets, we can understand it and we can predict it. And since Newton's work, we've understood that gravity applies not just in our solar system, but further beyond. Stars are in equilibrium because they're held together between two forces, the gravity, which is crushing them, and the pressure of their hot interiors is holding them up. And galaxies like our Milky Way galaxy, they are in equilibrium between the orbital motion of all the stars around the central hub of the galaxy and the gravity which is pulling them in. So it's gravity which holds galaxies together. And indeed, on an even bigger scale, clusters of galaxies. Newton's theory of gravity is extremely precise and it works very well in explaining most stars and things in the solar system and also uh, things um, within the galaxy. But it's got limits. First of all, it doesn't explain why the law is an inverse square law, why it falls off a factor of four if you go twice as far away. Nor does it really explain very clearly why the force of gravity is the same on everything. I mean, why should it be that the, uh, the feather and the lead ball in a vacuum fall at the same speed? It doesn't really explain that. And also, there are other limits to it which have become more apparent in the last hundred years, which is that it breaks down if things are moving very fast, if things are moving at a speed comparable to the speed of light. And that's why the theory which Einstein developed in 1915, just over 100 years ago, called general relativity, was a huge advance on Newton's theory of gravity. Einstein didn't prove Newton wrong. It's often said that he did, but that's unfair. What Einstein did was he transcended and extended Newton. He gave us a theory of gravity which agrees with Newton within Newton's uh, domain of relevance, but it applied for fast-moving objects, and it also applied when gravity was very strong. And that became very important in astronomy when we discovered objects where gravity is indeed very strong. In particular, here in Cambridge in 1968, uh, there was a discovery of objects called neutron stars. These are objects which um, are as heavy as a star, a bit heavier than the sun, in fact, but they are only about 10 kilometers across. And if you squeeze the mass of a star, the very small, then you get a very strong gravitational field. A field so strong that if you wanted to escape from a neutron star, you'd have to fire a rocket at half the speed of light. And if you were near to a neutron star, uh, then you'd find that light rays, which are only very slightly bent, by a star like the sun would be bent a lot. So you certainly need a theory beyond Newton's to understand the neutron star. And Einstein's theory 
is important in that context. Even more extreme are objects called black holes, where not only has the material become very dense, like a neutron star, but it's gone on collapsing. If you try to make a neutron star 10 times as heavy as the sun, for instance, you'd find that even the force of nuclei could not hold it up. It would go on contracting, and it would become what we now call a black hole. A black hole is something which has collapsed so much that not even light can escape from it. It's cut itself off from the rest of the universe, leaving, as it were, a gravitational imprint frozen in the space it's left. So it's a sort of dark domain in space which can suck things in, um, but nothing comes out of it. And we've known for the last 40 years that these objects actually exist. They're rather hard to detect, of course, because they are, by definition, black, uh, but uh, many have been found indirectly. The first ones were found by uh, looking for objects in binary star systems, when there is a small object orbiting around an ordinary star, and its gravitational field is tugging material from the surface of the ordinary star. And even though the black hole itself is invisible, material that's pulled towards it and swirls down into it, like a whirlpool, gets very, very hot and emits lots of radiation. So astronomers observed objects that were emitting very intense radiation uh, from a small object orbiting around an ordinary star. And they inferred that that small object was a black hole. And the gas swirling into it gave sporadic variation, often not just visible light, but X-rays and gamma rays as well. And so in that way, we found uh, that there were uh, black holes. Black holes don't just exist as the endpoint of stars. There's an even more dramatic way in which black holes form, and that is in the centers of galaxies. A galaxy is a big swirling disk of stars around some central hub, and the density of stars and the density of gas is higher towards the center. And we now know that right in the middle of almost all galaxies, there lurks a black hole weighing billions, in some cases, as much as the mass of the sun. These supermassive black holes are very important because if gas falls into them, then you get something which is hugely bright, far brighter than the galaxy. And objects called quasars, which were discovered by astronomers in the 1960s, where something in the center of a galaxy outshone all the billions of stars in the galaxy by a factor of 100 or so, these are now understood as massive black holes in the centers of galaxies, which are capturing gas or even entire stars from their surroundings. So black holes exist in our universe, uh, not just as stellar masses, but as supermassive uh, black holes. Now, black holes are crucially important because they exemplify Einstein's theory uh, in his most dramatic way. Einstein's theory uh, gave us a new way of looking at gravity. He thought of space and time as being linked together so that near a large mass, space is, as it were, curved, which means that light tries to follow the straightest path, but that path is a curved path. And near a black hole, space is, as it were, falling in. So Einstein's theory is really very counterintuitive because it tells us that we can't really think of uh, space as being fixed and flat. Space is itself dynamic. And the most dynamic manifestations of space occur when two black holes merge together. If you imagine two black holes which are in orbit around each other, then they will be in an orbit, and they will, as Einstein's theory predicts, emit what's called gravitational radiation, which is a sort of ripple in space itself, which moves outwards. And that will take away energy and make these two black holes get closer and closer, and then they'll eventually merge. And these black holes uh, will then uh, form one big one. And one of the most exciting developments recently, uh, in uh, 2016, was the uh, discovery of gravitational radiation uh, from a merger of two black holes about a billion light years away. What was observed 
was a tiny oscillation in space, which was induced by this uh, shattering event when two black holes merged. And at this distance, it's a tiny effect. It was a uh, one part in 10 to the power 21. Uh, and uh, that's equivalent to uh, moving by the thickness of a hair at the distance of Alpha Centauri, the nearest star. A tiny, tiny effect. But very, very precise measurements actually reveal this effect just in 2016. And this is an amazing technical achievement, uh, but it is the most spectacular vindication we've had so far of Einstein's theory. So Einstein's theory allows us to understand the extremes when gravity has overwhelmed all the other forces of nature to make a black hole. And Einstein's theory also is crucial to understand the very beginning of our universe, because at the beginning of our universe, space and time were uh, very uh, different from what they are today. And so Einstein's theory is crucially important. And one of the challenges which awaits 21st century physicists is to produce the final grand unification, unification between the force of gravity and Einstein's theory, which affects very large objects like stars, and the quantum theory, which affects atoms and molecules. Now, most of science gets by very well without a unification. That's because quantum theory is important for small things, like the atoms in a molecule, and gravity is not very important between small things. On the other hand, astronomers need to worry about gravity when they think about the orbits of planets and of stars. But the quantum fuzziness, the quantum uncertainty, is unimportant for things as big as a star or a galaxy, or even a planet. So astronomers haven't had to worry about quantum theory when they talk about orbits. But if we imagine the beginning of the universe, when everything was squeezed together, to very small dimensions, then we need to worry about quantum effects and about gravity at the same time. And so we need a theory which we don't yet have in order to understand the very beginning of the Big Bang and maybe whether our Big Bang was the only one. And so that is a challenge for 21st century physics. There's another thing about gravity which is very important, and that is that it is, though it's an important force for holding us on the ground, and for astronomy, it's in a sense a weak force in the following sense. If you take two atoms, then they have electrons in them and protons in them. And the electrical forces between the electrons and the protons are stronger than the gravitational force between the electrons and the protons by a huge number, almost 40 powers of 10. And that's why chemists don't need to worry about gravity. But the difference between gravity and electric forces is that for electric forces, there are positive and negative charges. And they always almost cancel out for any big object. But gravity always, as it were, has the same charge. It adds up. And what this means is that on big objects, gravity wins. Imagine you're building up solid objects. Let's imagine a sugar lump, a lump of rock then gravity is not important in those. Even for an asteroid, gravity is not important. But for something as big as a planet, gravity is important, and it then makes things round. And if you make a planet as big as Jupiter, then it starts to crush it. And if you tried to make a planet heavier than Jupiter, you'd find that it would get smaller, not larger. And eventually, if you make something more than 100 times as massive as Jupiter, it turns into a star. And so gravity wins for very big objects. But because it's weak, you have to pile together very many atoms. In fact, 10 to the power 57 atoms before you get something like a star. And that's a good, good thing, because if gravity wasn't so weak, then it wouldn't be possible for us to exist because we are able to exist because uh, we are made of complexity and layer upon layer of structure. And we contain many, many atoms, but we're not crushed by gravity. So if there weren't these huge numbers of powers of 10 between the force of gravity on the microscopic scale and the electric forces, then our complex universe couldn't exist. So gravity is a crucial force 
for moulding the universe and allowing stars and galaxies to exist and allowing us to be held down on the surface of the Earth. But the weaker it is, the better. So gravity, although the weakest force in nature, is crucial for its large-scale structure. <laughs>